Hey team, Dr. Jack Gordy here, and in the previous video, I sort of went through a brief introduction into what a p-value is, which is how we determine statistical significance in science, in particular medical and biological sciences. But part of the definition of what a p-value is, is this word test statistic and it was so complicated I didn't want to explain it in the previous video I wanted to do a whole video on what is a test statistic so let's jump into it so first of all let's go over that definition again I'm going to drill you with this definition over and over again because it's so kind of important that everyone has this definition built into their mental model so they understand science so the p-value is the probability of getting a test statistic as or more extreme as the one obtained given the null hypothesis is true. Now we went over null hypothesis in the previous video and in this video we're going to go over this test statistic problem here. So what is a test statistic? A test statistic is actually quite a magical thing when you think about it. It turns all your data and your research question into a single number. Right, so that's what a test statistic is trying to do, is trying to summarize all your data and your research question into a single number. So what are some examples of test statistics? As I go through this, you might recognize some of them. There's Z scores, which is what we're gonna go through today. There is a T score, this is a test statistic. There's an F ratio, that's a test statistic. There's a Man Whitney U test, um, and then there's a chi squared test. These are just some of the basic ones that you'll meet as you go on a statistical journey of knowledge. Um, so in this video, I'm going to cover the z-score. It's the most basic one, and it gives you such a good foundation for understanding the other ones. So the obvious place to start um, a, a talk about a z-score is to talk about Bigfoot. Now, Bigfoot uh, in Florida is called the Skunk Ape, and it's named after this photo here, which is just such an amazing photo. You can see the red eye of the Bigfoot there. And this photo was sent in with a letter, an anonymous letter, written by what looks like an old lady um, into like animal control or police station it was sent to. And it basically set, describes how she's concerned that there's an orangutan on the loose because this 10 foot thing keeps telling her apples and she took a photo of it. Now, I know Bigfoot doesn't exist, but boy, I really hope it does. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't the world be just that much more magical if Bigfoot exists? So, we have this, <laughs> how is this to do with statistics, Jack? Trust me, I'll get there, I'll get there. Okay, so. Bigfoot may exist, let's say that. Now, we find uh, this thing, uh, this animal potentially, passed out in the forest. It's six foot four and has weird hair, right? So we find this thing passed out in the forest. It's six, six foot four and has very weird hair. Now, we want to know the probability of finding just a regular human male that is at least as tall as this passed out animal, right? Is this animal can we reject the null hypothesis that this animal is human which provides evidence for the fact that this animal may or may not be bigfoot or skunk ape so my hypothesis is that this thing is not human that was passed out in the forest it's obviously a bigfoot aka skunk ape um, so what is the null hypothesis the null hypothesis is that it's a regular human male and it's just sampled from the normal population, the same population that all other human males are sampled from, right? So that's always the null hypothesis, is that it's not a special population, we're all sampling from the same population. So this human being is a, this animal is a sample from the human male population. That's the null hypothesis there. And so um, this is the distribution of heights in males, right? So we have the information on how tall this passed out animal in the forest is. It's six foot four. Here we have the height distribution of males in the US. Now, you might recognize this. What, what, what is this distribution? What do we call this? This is called a normal distribution. Now, so much of regular statistics that are used in medical and biological sciences uses this distribution and this phenomenon of this distribution. Now, it's a naturally occurring distribution, and it just follows that beautiful curve that we sometimes call a bell-shaped curve because it kind of looks like a bell. So this is a normal distribution. And you might go, what, what, 
why why would it have to be a normal distribution right and so there's a there's a mathematical way to think about it, but there's also an intuition way to think about it when you think about it intuitively most people you meet you know are around 5 10 5 11 and it's quite weird to meet someone seven foot tall right so you sort of understand that most people are in this chunk of height here so this is frequency this is in thousands so there's uh 1000 uh there's 1 1.5 million people that fall into this bracket about 165 to 170 centimeters tall in the u.s so mo you know most people you meet are around this height and it's quite rare to meet someone two meters tall and it's quite rare to meet someone 140 centimeters tall so the bell distribution kind of makes sense right um intuitively but there is actually quite a simple mathematical phenomenon behind it basically you get a normal distribution if you add up random events right so if i was to roll a whole bunch of dice like this and then record what number it is and then i would get a frequency graph like this <clears throat> so this is the number of times i've rolled the dice and i got this value so how many times did i get 70 around about 100 times when i rolled the dice um, how many times did I get 50? You know, around five times. So it's a net, you get a normal distribution just by adding, summing up random events. So with human height, you've got genetics, you've got nutrition, you've got, you know, exercise. If you exercise a lot as a kid, it can stunt your growth, for example. Um, so uh, there's a number of factors that all add together to sum up what your height will be. And actually, here's a cool little uh, example of this. So these are balls, and they are just going to fall through um, a random grid of pins. And each ball sort of has a 50-50 chance of falling on the either side of the pin. So as I flip it up, you can see the balls fall through those pins, and it all adds up to a normal distribution, right? So there's a 50-50 chance of them going this way, 50-50 chance of them going this way, and then as they go through the rows, some very lucky ones will get all the way out here, but the vast majority will go back and forth and back and forth, back and forth, and end up in the middle there. So normal distributions are just a natural phenomenon of adding up, summing random events. Isn't that cool? That is flippin' sweet. I love that. <laughs> right, so that's a normal distribution. And we use this normal distribution, our knowledge of normal distributions, to make statistical inferences using a lot of statistical tests. So let's jump back to our Bigfoot example. Here we have the distribution of heights, um, and we can see, you know, 100 centimeters tall. Most people are around this height. Very few people are around 190 centimeters tall. So we want to essentially ask, what is the probability that our past our animal came from this distribution given the extreme nature of its height? Or more extreme, right? So they could either be, he could either be six foot tall, a six foot four, or even taller. What's the probability of finding some, some data that or more extreme uh, given that we're assuming it comes from this distribution, which is our null hypothesis? So we need to remember a test statistic turns all your data and your research question into one number. Now to get it down to one number, we first have to um, start turning them, getting our data down to fewer numbers, right? There's a lot of numbers in here. There's actually how, how many uh, males are at each height um, in this distribution. So we need to turn this distribution into numbers so we can start reducing down the data until we eventually end up with one number, which is our test statistic which is a z score that's what we're going for we're going for a z score so have a think what two numbers do we typically use to summarize this kind of data or normal distribution data and the answer is the mean the average um, you sum up all the data divided by the n the number in the data and you end up with the average height which is somewhere around here but we need something else, don't we, as well? We need we need another number to sort of summarize how fat that data is. And that's the variation of the data. Um, also, um, although they're technically slightly different, um, the standard deviation of the data. This is a number that we use to um, quantify the variability of a distribution. It's sort of the standard deviation is when you think about the deviation from the mean. What's the standard level of deviation away from the mean um, in this distribution, right? 
So these are the two numbers that we need to uh, summarize the data and a means really easy. Standard deviation is a bit more complicated and it's actually not informative to learn all these formulas, um, but it's important to know what a standard deviation does. So here we have two uh, normal distributions. They both have the same mean. We need that other number to really describe these differences between those two different uh, uh, distributions and that's where the standard deviation comes in it tells you the variability aka the fatness of that normal distribution so we can see that the uh, blue line uh, distribution has quite a small standard deviation whereas the green uh, is a thick fat distribution so it has a large standard deviation right so that's what the standard deviation is doing so now we can see we've boiled all our research question and our, um, our data down to three numbers. The average height of the American male, the variation of that population, the standard deviation, how variable the data is. So the standard deviation of the average male in America, and then the passed out height of the entity, which was six foot four, which is about 93.4 centimeters. So we've managed to get our research question and our data down to three numbers. But remember, a test statistic is a single number. So now we have to get that data down to one number, and then we will have our test statistic. So a test statistic turns all your data and your research question down into a single number. So we're nearly there. So a good way to do it is to just visualize it because formulas are a little bit hard to remember. You know, they're a little bit foggy, but visualization I find is a great way to do it. So here's the tape measure. Um, here we've got the 1.7 meter, 1.8 meter, 1.9 meter, and two meter. It's in um, millimeters. So that's why we've got that extra zero there. So here is the average dude in America. And this image is actually an average image of an undergraduate at university. It's got a problem with which a lot of data sets have, which is that it has, uh, it's white centric. Um, and so a lot of data sets have that. Um, and we really need to address that in the scientific community. But anyway, so this is the average face of a dude. What happens if you sum up all the dudes? Boy, it, it does look like an average person. Um, here we have our past our animal of interest. This is how tall he is, you know, 1.93 meters, roughly six foot four. Now, what we can do is just count how many standard deviations our past our animal of interest is from the mean. So we've got one standard deviation to there, two standard deviations to there, and then another half a standard deviation. So this passed out individual in the forest is 2.5 standard deviations away from the mean, right? So, um, and, and in many respects, you can already see we've boiled all this data down to a single number, right? Because this data is incorporating the mean, the passed out animal, and the standard deviation. So it's boiled down all those numbers into just a single number of 2.5. Now, this is our Z score. So a test statistic summarizes all the data into one number. Here's our summary of the average height of a, a, a US male. Here's the variation of that population. Here's our past our animal of interest. And here is the formula for a Z score. The value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. This is the datum of interest. This is our passed out entity height right there. That's our distribution mean. That's our distribution standard deviation. Now this formula is just exactly what we just did. It's just counting the number of standard deviations between the mean and the uh, data of interest, which is 2.5. So now we have our test statistic. We have a Z score of 2.5. How do we turn that into a p-value? Well, this comes back to those magical properties of a normal distribution. So here is our normal distribution here, and here are these magical properties of it, that it, it seems mathematically that this is what happens with normal distribution. 68% of the data lies between one standard deviation from the mean. 95% of the data lies between two standard deviations. It's technically 1.5. 96, but close enough, it's, it, it sits between uh, two standard deviations of the mean and 99.7% of the data sits between three standard deviations. And we can actually calculate that for sort of every Z score. What percentage of the data lies between those values? And you can see here, you can start to build up a probability. So a p-value is the probability of getting 
a test statistic as or more extreme as the one obtained given the null hypothesis is true. So 2.5 is the Z score we've got. That is as extreme as minus 2.5. They're both right out on the periphery. They're both extreme values. But three is also as extreme. In fact, it's more extreme, right? So that's this part here, as or more extreme. So we're really asking what proportion of the distribution sits in these tiny little tails there and that gives us an idea of what was the probability of finding a human being that extremely tall or short or even more extreme given the null hypothesis is true that that animal came from the male human distribution and so we have all these tables that can do these calculations for us so you can look up a z score and it will tell you that what proportion sits under that table and that will give you your p-value just a little point here this is called a one-tailed hypothesis and i'm going to jump into that a little bit so anyway so my hypothesis is that the thing is not human so then the null hypothesis is that this animal is um, from a regular male human distribution, right? So um, what is the probability, purely by chance, of finding an animal passed out in the forest um, that's, uh, that is human, that is as tall or taller or as short or shorter or as extreme in height as the data that we got? So really we're asking what proportion sits in here or in here because that data is as extreme as the data that we've got. And the answer we get when we look up our tail tables is a p-value of 0.012, right? Which is less than 0 0.05. So we find that, but because the proportion of the population that is that extreme on the height distribution is below 5%, we would say this is statistically significant and we would reject the null hypothesis that this data was plucked from the human male distribution. And so that provides evidence for our hypothesis that this is a Bigfoot or Scub Ape. So it's official, statistically speaking, um, uh, Donald Trump is significantly not, uh, is, is statistically significant so therefore we would reject the null hypothesis that he is from the human male distribution now obviously you can see some problems with the p-value right like we know donald trump is human probably um uh so uh we, we can see that you know rare events do happen all the time in fact a p-value of less than uh, 0 0.05 is the same as saying five percent it's the same as saying one in 20. one in 20 events happen all the time in fact they happen one in 20 times right or five percent of the time these extreme things happen purely by chance right so you can start to see the problems with using these p-values that we do in statistical science and this is why whenever you read a paper um, a, a non-clinical or psychological paper whenever you read just regular biological papers they often test their hypothesis several times to build up the evidence because just a single test you know you can see right here a single significant value isn't that convincing um, to reject the null hypothesis we can't really reject the null hypothesis that this guy comes uh, this guy doesn't come we would reject the null and the null is that he comes from the human male distribution we can't really reject that really um, now I mentioned two tail versus one tail so as or more extreme implies that it's just out on the tail so it could be down here or down here and that's a two tailed uh, hypothesis because you're saying perhaps this individual is shorter or more more extreme in that direction or more extreme in that direction either direction and so we get a p-value of 0.02. Now we can do what's called a one-tailed hypothesis, right? Which is just asking the question in a single direction. And that you end up with a p-value that's half the other one because you're just looking at one tail down there, right? And so if I was to apply this to this research question that we've been investigating in this video, I would say, um, is our animal not human over here? Is our animal too tall to be human? See how I'm looking at just one tail there? Um, and so that would be a one-tailed hypothesis. Is our animal too tall to be human? This is a two-tailed hypothesis. Is our animal not human because of their height? It could be too short or too tall. 
Now, in biological sciences, we almost always do two-tailed hypothesis testing, and this is because we can't really know the direction of the effect before the experiment. Let's say we're testing a new drug um, to treat a disease. You might be tempted to do a one-tailed hypothesis to say, does our drug improve the condition of the patients, right? Um, but it's possible and also very important to know whether your drug actually makes the patient worse, right? So we need to investigate both directions of all our hypotheses. So very typically, we always do two-tailed hypothesis testing. Um, and you can already you can already see from the Donald Trump example, we don't want to get too loosey-goosey with our statistics or we're going to get significances popping up all over the show. So it's better to do the more conservative approach and look for a two-tailed hypothesis than the kind of aggressive approach and look for a one-tailed hypothesis, right? So the, that's a z-score. Is the individual likely to be part of this distribution? And Donald Trump was down here, so we can we rejected the null hypothesis that he came from the male human distribution. Um, but we don't typically work with n's of one in research, right? This is an n of one. This is a single data that we've found, right? So um, the height of Donald Trump, that's an n of one. There's only one in that study. We don't typically do that in medical research or um, biological sciences. It is a important to know because a lot of statistics builds on this um, but yeah it's not commonly used what's more commonly used is are these two samples different now this is a bit of a different question right now we've got actually two distributions here we're, we're not asking is this one data from this distribution we're asking are these two distributions different in some way and so that is a very different question and it requires a different test and we, typically we use the t statistic in here or which is our um that's our uh, uh, t statistic is a t statistic here or our t score um, which is just like a z score but it's a t score um, and this is the foundation of the t test which i'm sure many of you have heard of and that is what i'm going to cover in the next video how do t tests work so stay tuned for that and tune in for the uh, next video